120 or 150 say 152 and um, <coughs> it's the last lecture on Windows and this class is nearly over um, we got the last lecture on Windows and then there's Thanksgiving and then just I'll have one lecture on the Mac and if you want to study for it and take the quiz that's extra credit and then there's just the last class and I'm not sure what I'll do then I probably won't introduce any new material um, and uh, that's it so this is probably the uh, only significant lecture that remains and let me see if I've got it open somewhere all right good so this is the last bit of Windows all right so we're going to talk about uh, other artifacts other than the registry left in on your Windows machines so when you log in it records a lot of information showing that you have logged in. Let me move this to the left a little, make it show up better. All right, so you can log in at the console or through remote desktop or through screen sharing with other software. These are various ways to make interactive sessions. And um, so Microsoft leaves various uh, marks in the operating system when you do that. Uh, for one thing, it records all your recent files. It makes links, which are shortcuts to all your recent files, and there's a separate list for each user profile. So there will be links, depending on who logged in, they'll be able to tell what files each user has been using. They're in various places, but they tend to be, they're here, you see an app data roaming these days. <coughs> all right. And so this has the path network share if it came from a network share um, and a lot of other information like timestamps and an object identifier so you know useful information to show what people have been doing and you can uh, create a timeline from them showing just what people have been doing what files they accessed and in what order there are also jump lists if you right click one of these things at the bottom of the screen you'll see a list of the recently opened objects and here's a separate one for each one of the uh, icons you put at the bottom of your screen. So that's another group of uh, recent or frequently used files that are recorded called jump lists. And those are stored here, again, in the roaming profiles, automatic destinations, custom destinations. <coughs> like a lot of these things, it's an unreadable binary file, and you need a special tool to uh, unpack it. Here's a couple tools that can do it. And then there's the recycle bin. When you throw things away in Windows, they sit in the recycle bin. It, it increases to a certain size, I think something like 15% of your disk, you can adjust it. And then it starts throwing away the old stuff as the new stuff comes in to prevent it from growing any further. But you can uh, recover things that are in the recycle bin, of course. And there are forensic tools that will go in there and list everything in the recycle bin. Here's one of them, Reefy UD. And, of course, Velociraptor can do it. You can collect the data from the recycle bin. It will show you what's in there, uh, the date it was deleted, and you can recover files from it. And then there's memory forensics. We've talked about this before. You can, you can uh, collect parts of the memory, like the memory belonging to certain processes, or you can collect all the memory. And then you have to run it through a special parsing tool, uh, like Memorize, to understand it. And uh, all right, so it's, and of course everything about the current activities on the machine is in RAM. Network connections, running processes, drivers, um, often user credentials in various ways, uh, the registry, console commands, whatever data you've been typing into Word documents or anything else, you know, all sorts of things. Whatever you've been doing currently is in the memory. So there's physical RAM chips, which is what you normally talk about collecting memory. And then there is extra memory on the hard disk in the page file, which is pieces of memory that Microsoft Windows, in its wisdom, has decided to copy to the hard disk for no apparent reason. <coughs> in the uh, long, long ago, or if you use Linux, the page file was there in case you ran out of memory then it would put pages on the hard disk. Microsoft Windows uses the page file all the time, even when you're not using all the memory in some arcane way that nobody understands. But the fact is, all kinds of stuff from the real RAM end up in the page file. And you can find stuff there. 
Uh, then if the machine crashes the blue screen of death, it can do a memory dump. The default is just the kernel memory, but you can configure it to make a complete memory dump when that happens. That is not the normal situation. You'd probably only have that turned on if you paid for a Microsoft support contract. <coughs> and you're um, going to send that to Microsoft for them to debug your software problems. But there it is. It's in uh, local app data crash dumps. And then there's hibernation files. Uh, this is more common. You configure the machine not to shut down, but to save the memory on the disk when you close the lid and when you open it to come up and with everything still running the way it was. So then it makes a complete copy of the RAM in the hybrid file. Now it used to just be a one for one uncompressed copy. So if you had four gigs of RAM, you'd have four gigs of hybrid file. But then Apple started compressing the contents of RAM to make your RAM go further, which is an excellent idea. And Microsoft cut on, and now they compress the hybrid file. So that means you need a special tool to parse it, and volatility is a very good tool for all this RAM analysis. Volatility is very powerful. It's all up to date. It knows the latest versions of Windows 10 and everything else, and it can pull all kinds of good stuff. Every process, the contents of the commands you've been typing in command lines, the text in notepads, all sorts of stuff. It can pull it right out of there. Here's volatility running on Kali. Python vol.py getting a process list. Now this is an old machine, Windows 2008, but it works on Windows 10 now too. And so here's a list of all the running processes. Process ID, parent process ID, and so on. And you can uh, really find a lot of data. It can take a long time to run though like 10 minutes to parse through that, but you can recover a lot of what's been going on with a memory image and volatility. All right, let's take a look at these cahoots. nonsense. The Google um, Drive thing I'm using for backup, they've updated it and now it doesn't work. Anyway, um, it constantly locks my files. I'm trying to save a file and it will decide that it has to like back it up to the cloud so it won't let me uh, save my file frequently. I have to keep redoing work. This is why I moved away from Dropbox and stuff. A lot of people don't maintain their Windows clients or their Mac clients for these cloud services. Uh, so it just quits working and they just leave it broken forever. Anyway, let's uh, proceed. There are only three people, so there's not a lot of competition. But anyway. All right, if you right click a taskbar icon, what are you looking at? That's a jump list. All right. All right. What do you have to get from live acquisition? Good. That's the RAM. Where do I find the full contents of RAM? All right, that's hybrid file. <coughs> okay, which one has kernel memory? All 
Yep, that's the crash dump. All right. So handles, we talked about them before. Handles are these objects, is jump lists in mobile apps. What? Uh, I know, I think, I think mobile apps must be an extra words in your question. Uh, roaming profiles is a Microsoft thing where you log into a domain controller and even if you log into a different machine, it will load your desktop and your customized program menus and anything. Those things are called roaming profiles. They are a big feature that Microsoft likes in Windows domains. So that's why they have that roaming thing. And therefore, certain items stored in your profile are considered roaming, which means when you log into a different machine in the domain, they will go with you. But other things like your browser temporary files are not in the roaming folder and they are not reproduced on another machine. That's the idea. I think none of this really matters anymore. This mattered a decade or more ago when people didn't all have laptops. <coughs> and you didn't carry your machine with you. You would just log into different machines as you moved to like a different company branch and stuff. Anyway, um, it's a good question because a lot of this Microsoft stuff, you know, you have to kind of know Microsoft tech support to understand it. So handles, if you open a file to read or write, you get a handle to it. And the same thing's true of a lot of other objects. So these are the um, items that refer to other objects in memory. Um, all right, there's also mutants or mutexes, which are just marks you put in memory so that other processes can see that you're doing something. And uh, they can lock a resource that way. And it's commonly used by malware to mark a box as infected so the malware knows not to try to reinfect it again. So here, if you get infected by Zeus, an old banking trojan, then you can take a memory dump and analyze it with volatility and find the handles. And here's the handles. And this Avira 2108 handle is a mark that Zeus puts on your box so Zeus knows that you're infected. So it's a useful indicator of compromise, but you need a memory dump to see it. And so if you open up Notepad and look in Process Explorer, you can see the handles and... Uh, they're down here. Here's a mutant. It creates a mutant with this strange thing, MSCTF, mutex default, and so on. All software uses these handles. And you can collect the mutants in Velociraptor. Of course, you, in the all-purpose tool, you can use it for almost everything. It can select collect the mutants from a live system. All right, every process has its own allocated memory segments. We've seen them uh, in various tools. So you get uh, a certain region of RAM allocated to one process. <coughs> now the uh, OS will also copy that box of RAM at random into the page file. And there is a kernel data structure called the virtual address descriptor, which shows what memory is used by each process. You can also see it by using a sysinternals tool called VM map. This will just list all the areas of memory and you can see how they're used by everything. Total region in here is uh, various regions of memory, 70,000, 8, 9,000, and so on, uh, showing different regions have reserved for different purposes. All right, and Velocity Raptor can uh, enumerate the VID, that file, so you can get the memory map from a running machine in Velocity Raptor. And then you could decide what region of memory you want to look at. Uh, you might want to find malicious dills because it's the number one way that attackers manage to get code execution on a box. So the simple thing we've done in the projects is check to see if things have valid digital signatures. That's a pretty good clue that they're not malicious. Um, you can compare hash values to known libraries of good and bad hashes. There are several online resources of known good files, and there's virus total where you can search a hash to see if it is a known bad file. And uh, you can also look for malware that loads dills from strange folders or surreptitiously. Um, so watching how processes manipulate dills is often a way to spot malicious activity. Here's Notepad, and Notepad uses all these libraries. So 
and see these are all loading from C Windows System 32, except for this one, which is C Windows, C Windows side by side, which is where you put 32-bit code or old versions of DILs that have been updated. So that's reasonable too. So none of this looks suspicious right here. They're all signed except for a couple that are not signed. And <coughs> that's one thing that makes it irritating. Microsoft doesn't really sign all their code. So these are probably harmless, but you might want to find out what these location 2008 NLS files are. I don't know what they are. Doesn't seem like they're proper libraries. I'd have to go find out what an NLS file is and see what it is. I'm pretty sure it's harmless, but uh, you have to do a lot of research. You'll always see things that are funny looking. So you can and you can get the uh, dills loaded by running process from Velociraptor as well. Then you can get network connections, loaded drivers, the command history, strings in memory, possibly credentials left there by browsers and such um, in memory. You can look in the page file. It's like memory, no particular structure. You can look for strings. Uh, I don't think there's any tool that can actually find out what part of this belongs to which process or anything, um, but you can still look for strings in there. The problem is you don't know what they mean. For example, a lot of antivirus tools will then have a bunch of indicators of compromise in their code, and so you'll find things here and think you're infected, but you might not be infected. It might just be that that sequence of bytes was in memory because an antivirus product was using it. So that's uh, questionable how much real good you get out of the page file. <coughs> All right, and there's process injection and hooking in memory. Process injection is where you modify memory after a process has been loaded and run. You suspend the process, you alter the RAM and resume it, and now it's running different code than it was supposed to run, and it will continue to run with the same privileges. So that's pretty cool. You can detect it by showing that the disk files don't match the memory file anymore. And you can do this with the Windows API. You can suspend a process, alter the memory, and resume it. You can directly write code to the memory. Um, or you can force the target process to load another library. These are various ways to add malicious code to a running process. And then there's process replacement. Uh, oh, I see. I'm confused. This is the one I was describing before, process replacement. I don't understand what this is. This seems exactly the same as process replacement to me. Uh, I guess this must be, you can use a dill or you can write directly to it, I guess. Okay, fair enough. So this is dills and this is process replacement where you overwrite the memory. All right. So you'll find memory sections with execute, read, and write permissions, which is not normal and not supposed to be allowed. You should never be able to write and execute the same zone to try to stop command injection attacks. And if the processes don't match the corresponding disk files, that's a clue that something like this has been going on. Sysmon can detect it. If you load Sysmon on your machine, here is Sysmon. Uh, create remote thread detected. So this is a an event that launched a remote thread. So it launched code in another process. And so that's a suspicious activity. <coughs> All right, so uh, the process that does the injection has to be restarted somehow, so you might find it in the auto run keys or one of the auto start extensibility points. And then there's hooking, which um, lets you interrupt other system activities, other API calls, and cause code to be run first. Uh, this is intended for special hardware devices or antivirus products or many other things. So you can hook an API call and cause it to run extra code before it runs that call. And therefore, you can use malicious hooking and cause it to hide files and processes, use it for keyloggers, and so on. The old-fashioned way was to modify the import address table, which is pretty easy to catch because you modify the header of an executable file. Um, the later way used until a few years ago was to hook the SSDT in the kernel. So you would modify all calls to kernel routines and cause them to go somewhere else. To prevent that, Microsoft pretty much locked everybody out of the kernel. So you can't do that anymore with this kernel patch protection. So modern rootkits, I don't really understand how modern rootkits in the kernel work. 
uh, they can't use this old trick anymore. And there is some new trick. There is some new kernel-based rootkits, but I don't know how they work. But I know how the user land ones work. They work with the other kind of hooking we talked about. So here's Zeus um, detecting an inline hook to this one function, HTTP send request. So your um, win inet.dil hooking my hook address is a27366 down here. So here's what's supposed to be a Windows API call, but instead of having the usual stuff here, which is always push ESP, move ESP to EVP to set up the uh, stack frame, it has a jump somewhere else instead. So when you try to run Windows API call, it will go down here and run this extra code and then eventually come back here. So that's, uh, that's what a hook does. <coughs> And they did it by directly replacing the RAM that contained the API code with a jump. That's another way to do it. All right. So here's memory analysis tools. The best one is volatility for most purposes, but Velociraptor does some memory analysis too. And there are a lot of others. You can acquire it with FTK Imager or Memorize or Velociraptor. But analyzing it, the main tools are Memorize and Volatility. I'm sure there are commercial tools too, but those are the free ones I know about. All right. We're done with that. We'll go to this. Ah, good. All right. Well, let's go ahead. All right. A kernel data structure that shows how memory is used by each process. That's the VAD, Virtual Address Descriptor, or something like that. All right, malware signatures might appear here even when you don't have any malware. in the page file, also in memory, because they have to be used by the antivirus while it's processing. What's the most likely malicious technique? All right, process injection. All right, what does malware use to prevent reinfection? Mutants, also called mutexes. There may be some difference, but I can't remember what it is.
So, other persistence mechanisms are shown up here very seasonally. Port swigger. Yeah, I saw that. A Hack Friday sale. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Yeah. Well, that's neat. A sale on port trigger certificates. Fair enough. I'll be teaching that class next semester. Anyway, so here's other ways to make things persist. There's a startup folder where you put a shortcut and it'll launch every time you reboot. Um, scheduled tasks. You can modify the system binary or these attacks. So startup folder is the classic way to make something uh, launch. You just put it in the startup folder. Back in Windows XP, you could just right click the start button and explore the startup folder. Ever since then, they've made it really hard to find as you see this really long, complicated path. But anyway, you can put a shortcut there to make something start every time you boot up the machine. Um, then there's scheduled tasks. You can make something start and repeat on any kind of time schedule or at boot up or at other times. Um, there are Windows binaries that start every time you start up. All these processes, there's a hundred or more things that launch automatically when you restart the machine. And you can add malicious code to any of those Windows binaries, and that will break the signature. But as we've seen, Microsoft does not enforce signature verification, as far as I can tell. And so you can probably make it run anyway. <coughs> All right. All right. And so uh, if you do modify the system binaries, you're likely to trash Windows, so it's best to work with unimportant services and be careful. Um, if you don't want to make it crash and therefore defeat the purpose by causing somebody to call tech support, which will re-image their machine and clean off your malware. So to defend it, Microsoft has put a whole series of defenses to try to scan the system binaries and make sure they haven't been altered. Uh, there was something called Windows File Protection, then Windows Resource Protection um, is what they have now. And this makes it a little bit harder to modify system binaries, although it's still not all that hard to do. Sticky keys is a handicapped accessibility feature where if you press the shift key five times before logging in, it will pop up the on-screen keyboard so you can use some other input device to log in. Then it launches this thing called sethc.exe. So if you put some other file in that place instead of sethc, it will launch that. And that's a way to get in. Uh, put like a command prompt there and it will open. It has to open the system privileges because you haven't logged in yet. So it's a way to get a system uh, command prompt on a Windows machine. All right, so sticky keys supposedly doesn't work anymore. You can't replace Seth C, but there's another way to get the same thing by adding a registry key. All right. And Windows Defender can now detect if you change that registry key. So, um, you know, these things go back and forth. <coughs> And then there's DIL load order hijacking, which we've been doing in the projects. Um, known DILs tell the machine where to look for official DILs, usually see Windows System 32, but things that are not in the known DILs, will, it will just hunt all over the place for them, and you can put a fake DIL in any folder with the right name, and it will be fooled and accept it. And we've done that in the projects. So here's the known DILs. And you see it has a list of these DILs and where they should be. They're all in this directory, and it tells you all these DILs should all be in C Windows System 32. So that's a good thing. So if it's not in known DILs, then it goes through this search, uh, where the application is loaded, then uh, the current working directory and other places, or a different path, depending on whether safe DIL search mode is enabled or disabled. But the directory where the application is loaded is the first place it always looks. And usually when you trick somebody into downloading something, you have a folder in their downloads folder and you put your DIL right there. So it will look there. And that's, of course, intentional because a lot of software does have custom DILs you brought in. But uh, if, it, if there's a system DIL that's not in the known DILs list, then you can trick it into loading what it thinks is a system DIL from here. All right, so it works. Dill loader harder hijacking, which we've done in the projects, works if it's not in known dills. We did in the project, uh, pardon me, for 126, not in this class. And those are the conditions under which it'll work. So here's an example. NT Shrewy is something Microsoft loads. And you can just put one in another location, and it will load the other thing called NT Shrewy and be fooled by it. 
All right. That's the last one. Let's go to the last cahoots, which are here. All right, so which technique produces dot job files? Those are scheduled tasks, also called recurring tasks. All right, which one uses the app data directory? Oh, that's where the startup folder is. That long path is in the app data. That's right. Okay, good. All right. What happens when you press shift five times? All right. Sticky keys. All right. And what do you prevent with... WRP, Windows Resource Protection, I think. Okay, that's system binary modification. All right. All right. <coughs> 